Dr. Hazima Mozam and I, will, I welcome you all to the fifth uh, lecture under Comstech Entity Network uh, joint lecture, lecture, um, lecture series. Uh, this lecture will be delivered by Professor Dr. Ariel Silbar. Professor Dr. Ariel Silbar is a professor at uh, Institute of Biomedical Sciences, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, we are very grateful for Professor Dr. Ariel uh, for his time and for accepting our invitation. The title of his talk today is The Role of Amino Acids in the Bioenergetics of Trypanosoma cruzi. And uh, the, the purpose of this lecture series is to promote global and scientific cooperation and build research capacity um, to find new and better therapeutic solutions for the neglected tropical diseases, which remain a huge uh, main health burden in the member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. We are also very grateful to our participants who are joining us from various parts of the world. And with this, I request Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry, Coordinator General Comstech and Director ICCPS to introduce and welcome our guest speaker today. Over to you, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are in different time zones. As always, uh, this is a global lecture series where we have uh, participants from four different uh, continents, from South America to uh, Asia and for Eastern Asia, in fact. Uh, this uh, lecture series, I'm extremely grateful to uh, our colleague in Durham University, uh, Professor Dr. Paul Denny and Max for uh, agreeing to conduct this uh, uh, lecture series and for the effort of Dr. Summer Yusuf and Kazima Mazam for taking it through. But I think the most important component of it is to have wonderful speakers. And we've been absolutely fortunate to have some of the most, uh, uh, most prominent speakers in the field of parasitology, in the field of uh, molecular medicine, uh, in the field of uh, drug discovery and development. And uh, uh, today's speaker is uh, someone uh, uh, who is very close to my heart. I met him first time in Durham several years ago, and I was always hoping that I would be able to see him more often, but pandemic has affected our meeting, and since then we are actually meeting only through online. I hope and pray that Ariel would be able to come and visit us in Pakistan. Comstech uh, uh, is an organization which represents 57 member states of the OIC, uh, which is Organization of Islamic Co Cooperation. And these countries are located in four continent of the world. So you would be uh, pleased to know that uh, two countries in South America, Suriname and Guyana, are the members of OIC. And then most of West Africa, Central Africa, and East Africa, Middle East and North African region, uh, Central Asia uh, and South Asia, are the member, the 57 member states. And unfortunately, many of these states are these developed. They are in tropical countries. They're affected from a full range of different problems, including illiteracy, lack of medical supplies, uh, a lack of healthcare research, and of course, triple burden of diseases. <laughs> that is the reason why we found it extremely important to have this program, structure program, in which entity and Comstech work together to, uh, to introduce and develop capacity of uh, scientists in this region. And they should be able to benefit from top uh, speakers of the world. We intend to continue this uh, lecture series into actually workshops on various skill sets related to uh, uh, tropical diseases, uh, drug identification, uh, lead identification and drug, drug target identification and I'm sure that different skill sets in the form of workshop would benefit a lot of younger people and also to help us to take this legacy of this wonderful project beyond its lifespan and would be able to have new linkages uh, developed between the scientists. I'm absolutely pleased to introduce uh, my dear friend, Professor Dr. Ariel M. Silva. Uh, he's from the laboratory uh, of uh, uh, Tripsonoma, and he's among leading experts in parasitology. 
He works for the Department of Parasitology, Institute of Biomedical Sciences, University of Sao Paulo. He's from Argentina, as, uh, as we know, uh, but he has been working in Brazil since long. Uh, he graduated from the Biological Science and got his PhD uh, from the Faculty of Exact and Natural Sciences of University of Buenos Aires. After that, he migrated to Brazil where he obtained his postdoctoral position funded by uh, Sao Paulo Science Foundation and, uh, and, and then start working at the Department of Biochemistry, Institute of Chemistry, University of Sao Paulo. After that, uh, he obtained uh, his first grant as an independent early career researcher funded by FAPESP. In 2006, uh, he was hired as an assistant professor by the Department of Parasitology at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, University of Sao Paulo. And since then, he's working as a very high caliber, very productive scientist at that department. He uh, has a, a fairly intense uh, engagement with the subject as he is a very frequent traveler in different South American countries as well as in Europe. Uh, he has been promoted to the highest cadre of uh, academic leadership and uh, he is now uh, is among the top uh, scientists in the field of trypsonoma uh, tropical diseases and his emphasis has been largely on the biochemistry of, uh, of, of, parasitol of parasites. Uh, he is also a member of the board of directors of Brazilian Society of uh, Protozoology. Uh, he is, uh, uh, his research has been focused uh, on various aspects of parasitology. And the topics of his interest has been on metabolism and metabolites, transposed by energetics, mitochondrial physiology uh, of parasites. Uh, as well as uh, uh, the development and validation of uh, new drug targets to design new anti-parasitic drug, which is very, very important because these are neglected tropical diseases and very little funding and international attention is unfortunately available to identify new targets and thus to identify new drugs. Uh, Ariel uh, is certainly uh, one of the most cherished uh, person working in the field of Chagas disease. And uh, he has deciphered uh, the complex life cycle of trypsonoma at the molecular level. And today he's going to talk about some of his fascinating research. I have had the honor of meeting him and listening to him. And I'm sure that you would all benefit. Uh, there are a lot of people online and I'm sure that you would be able to benefit from this wonderful presentation of today. Thank you very much. And I invite Ariel for his presentation. Thank you very much uh, for this very kind uh, introduction, Iqbal. And uh, I would like, before starting, I would like to say thank you to you, Summer, and uh, Comstec for this opportunity uh, of uh, showing our research here. Uh, okay, I can uh, share my my screen now. Yep. Yeah. So, yes. okay. So, uh, is it okay? Are you seeing the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect, perfect. So we are in conditions to stop. You you can see the mouse uh, just to use as a pointer. I am not uh, finding the. Yeah, we can see we can see the mouse also. Yeah. Oh, here. Okay, I, I can I can use this uh, laser tool. Okay, perfect. So uh, I will try. I, I try to fit a good quantity of data that we have been obtaining in the last uh, times about the metabolism of Trypanosoma cruzi, and we focused uh, pretty much on the metabolism of amino acids. And uh, I think you will understand soon in the presentation why. Um, so a bit about this seminar, uh, I will uh, make a brief introduction about uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, its lifestyle and metabolism, and then I will go to the very basic fundamentals of, of uh, uh, mitochondria and how we can think the, the, the mitochondria as a battery, okay? So we can talk about the bioenergetics uh, using some uh, 
a very basic uh, electric uh, concepts. Then I will go uh, to three amino acids, with, which are among the main uh, metabolized amino acids by Trypanosoma cruzi. And finally, I will try to show you uh, 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 how we can obtain some numbers about uh, the uh, mitochondria um, uh, yield in, in terms of uh, bioenergetics, okay? So I will start by the first point. So initially I will introduce you to Trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi is the causative agent of Chagas disease. Uh, it has a complex life cycle which happens between an invertebrate host, which is uh, popularly known in English as kissing bug, and a vertebrate host. Humans, of course, are here, okay? So in the, I will not go into the details, but uh, uh, in both hosts, the parasite alternates uh, between uh, replicative non-infective forms. For example, in the insect vector, it is the epimastigote, okay? That in some conditions differentiate into infective non-replicative forms like uh, the metacyclic cryptomastigotes. Once inside the mammalian host, we have also this kind of transitions. In fact, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi is strictly intracellular. Uh, it needs to invade the mammalian host cells in order to differentiate into the first um, replicative form, which is called a mastigote, because the, uh, it doesn't have a, um, evident flagellum. The amastigo differentiates into an intermediate form, uh, which is also replicative and non-infective, which is the intracellular epimastigote. It is called like this because it has some similarities with this epimastigote uh, occurring in the insect vector. And in some conditions, this intracellular epimastigote differentiates into tripomastigotes, which burst from the cell by lysing the host cell and are released into the uh, extracellular medium. Once there, these parasites can reach the blood, uh, the bloodstream, and uh, if this vertebrate is by is bitten by a kissing bug that it is making its uh, blood meal in th in that moment, it can take uh, up these tripomastigote forms, and they will differentiate in the midroot into epimastigotes, which will colonize and infect a new insect vector, which will be able to transmit it again to other vertebrate hosts. One thing that it is important to keep in mind is that this, uh, the, the entire infection uh, of the kissing bug happens in the midroot. okay? It doesn't reach other uh, territories of the body of the insect. So, the epimastigotes colonizes, uh, colonize the uh, midwood of the insect in the anteroposterior anterior direction. And in the terminal portion, these forms, uh, the infective forms are formed. So they are expelled together with the uh, feces and urine one, uh, each time the insect makes it its blood. Okay. So this is important in terms of this seminar because uh, for being all the time in the uh, digestive tube of the insect, these forms are uh, submitted to many uh, um, severe um, stresses. I would like to focus on the nutritional stress uh, because we will talk about bioenergetics. So uh, this is one of the things that the parasite needs to uh, cope with, okay? And uh, the nutritional stress is particularly severe because of two, um, uh, two issues. First, the parasite needs to compete uh, uh, with the very efficient uh, uh, epithelium cell for the nutrients. These cells are very efficient for taking up nutrients from the midwood one each time the parasite Feed the, sorry, the insect feeds itself. But the other thing, which is uh, most uh, uh, tough for the parasite, is the fact that this insect feeds itself in nature more or less once each two to three months. Okay, so most of the time the parasite is under kind of starvation conditions. Okay, so this is the reason that we are uh, trying to analyze how the parasite can take advantage of the small quantities of amino acids that it can uh, meet in this environment in order to make them uh, render energy, okay? So uh, just a bit, the situation in the mammalian host cell is as well uh, quite complicated for the parasite because it is uh, uh, 
uh, hosted in the cytoplasm, not in an organelle. So the parasite in the host cell cytoplasm as well needs to compete uh, uh, for nutrients with the enzymatic system of the mammalian host cells that it is infected, okay? Uh, in this talk, I will focus mostly on epimastigotes because this is the form of the parasite that we have been studying more. And this is because we can obtain them in axonic cultures and we can obtain them in good, in, in, in high quantities. Once we understand, uh, as much as we go uh, uh, and understand better the metabolism of these forms, we can go for my pre more precise uh, questions to uh, a more complicated system, which are the intracellular stages or the amastigote itself, okay? But in this talk, I will talk uh, mostly about the amastigote, which is the replicative form, uh, predominant replicative form in the intestine, in the digestive tube of, of the insect. Very well, so about the metabolism, I will not uh, 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 go in deep on the whole metabolism because we not, don't have the time for that, but, uh, just for introducing this talk, I would like to uh, uh, call your attention for this uh, kind of curves. This kind of graphics has been published uh, several, time, several times by many groups, but essentially what, the, what it shows is that uh, uh, if you follow the black line here, which is the, uh, represents the proliferation of the epimastigotes in cultural medium, and you follow at the same time these black bars here, which represent the, the remaining uh, glucose in the cultural medium at uh, a long time, you can see that as much as the parasite proliferates, it consumes glucose, but it doesn't consume it completely. At certain time, it stops consuming glucose and something happens that makes the parasite to release ammonium, which is represented in the gray bars meaning that there is a metabolic switch in some moment, we, we usually detect this at the mid exponential phase in which the parasite stops consuming carbohydrates and it starts to consume amino acids, okay? And uh, uh, this has been observed a good time ago. Uh, in fact, uh, here, this table is from a paper that has been published in the 76 uh, last century, okay? Some almost uh, 50 years ago, in which these authors uh, uh, started the parasites and then stimulated them uh, with uh, uh, some metabolites one by one. And they measured the oxygen consumption to see which metabolites are oxidated by the parasite. And they found that among the, the ones that are more oxidated are proline, aspartate, and glutamate. There are others that we are adding in this list uh, but in that time, these were the ones that they uh, tested. And this was uh, uh, very interesting because this pointed to proline in that time, aspartate and glutamate as well, as main uh, carbon and energy sources for the parasite. One other thing that I would like to attract your attention on is the fact that uh, the oxidation of metabolites in Trypanosoma cruzi uh, both uh, carbohydrates or amino acids are not complete. And the main products of this oxidation, of course, you can have uh, uh, CO2 as a product of the metabolism, but at the same time, there are other metabolites uh, uh, that are excreted, uh, which are quite uh, uh, reduced. And uh, this is a very a curious thing in a parasite that suffers of, a metabolic, of chronic metabolic stress, okay? So they excrete as well succinate, which is weird because it is a very valuable metabolite in terms of energy, okay? And alanine, which is as well a very uh, valuable metabolite um, uh, in terms of energetic succinate because it is an intermediate of the a TCA cycle, as you know, and alanine, because alanine is nothing else than an aminated form of pyruvate. So, as you know, pyruvate is the main product of the glycolysis. So, uh, uh, one question that we are trying to answer now, and I will go to this on the end of this talk, is why a parasite that suffers of metabolic stress would be excreting a very uh, valuable metabolite like uh, pyruvate in the form of alanine? We, 
uh, some time ago, we revisited this uh, issue of the metabolic uh, uh, switch uh, in trypanosoma cruzi. We uh, analyzed by uh, direct uh, targeted metabolomics, exponential and stationary phase uh, parasites. And we, as you can see in this heat map, we uh, clearly saw a, a, a change in the pattern of consumption of metabolites. This is the stationary phase, and these are metabolites related to amino acid consumptions, and this is the exponential phase, and these are metabolites related to the uh, uh, glycolysis. Okay, these uh, have been represented in this kind of uh, charts, in which, for example, have uh, glucose uh, and pyruvate as entry and exit of glycolysis, which are uh, increased in the stationary phase with respect to the, uh, sorry, in the exponential phase with respect to the stationary. And the same happened with the intermediates of the TCA cycle that we were able to detect with the only exception of alpha ketoglutarate, which has the opposite pattern. And this makes completely sense because alpha ketoglutarate is the main entry door to the TCA cycle uh, uh, and to the oxidation system of metabolites such as proline, glutamate, histidine, and asparagine, for example. Okay, so uh, here we have, for example, remarked the uh, situation with histidine and uh, proline, in which we have that, for example, the uptake of histidine and uh, its presence, intracellular presence in the exponential in the stationary phase is increased with respect to the exponential, and something similar happens with proline, showing that uh, confirming in a way that they are being more taken up and metabolized. Okay, so I will now go very quickly to the very uh, fundamentals of uh, mitochondrial biology, just to, to, to make a quick reminder of some of the characteristics of the mitochondria. Uh, it has been called the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, we need to make a disclaimer here because this is not uh, considered anymore the only function of mitochondria. This uh, was uh, this, this um, uh, expression was uh, said by uh, Sikiewicz uh, in the in the in the fifties, but uh, now a lot of um, uh, uh, new information brought uh, uh, new functions for mitochondria, like for example being responsible for the cellular redox balance, cell signaling, the formation of the clusters of iron sulfur, uh, which are uh, the core of many essential proteins for all. Uh, uh, living organisms, and uh, the mitochondria uh, has, uh, holds inside specific metabolic pathways in eukaryotes like beta oxidation, polyamine biosynthesis, and, and so on. So mitochondria uh, uh, plays uh, many roles beyond the being the powerhouse of the cell, but we will focus on this one right now, okay? Uh, in particular, in trypanosomes, this is valid for all trypanosomes, uh, uh, mitochondria have some uh, unique characteristics, uh, starting by the, by the fact that these organisms have only one mitochondria per cell, and this is important for some uh, calculations that I will show at the end, okay? It is a giant mitochondria that occupies between 10 and 30% of the total cell volume, depending on the species, on the stage, and so on. And it holds approximately 30% of the total DNA uh, uh, of the cell, okay? Um, so how we can think the mitochondria as a battery, uh, and, and this is something that I'm interested in to make some bioenergetics uh, calculations afterwards. So as you probably know, uh, um, uh, all reduced metabolites during the catabolism, like sugars, amino acids, or fatty acids, are oxidated in a very controlled way through um, complex metabolic pathways. And this, in, during this oxidation, the electrons extracted from these metabolites are uh, delivered into cofactors like uh, fat to make fat H2, NAD to make NAD H and NAD P to make, make NAD PH. This can happen in many compartments of the cells, including mitochondria. But the only thing that happens in the mitochondria, of course, in mitochondriated organisms, is the fact that all these cofactors in the presence of oxygen produce electricity 
And this electricity is the responsible for, for the driving force for producing ATP, okay? And this is something that uh, uh, many often is forgotten by the people working on metabolism. And this is a characteristic that it is exclusive uh, uh, of the mitochondria, at least from we, what we know so far. And how this happens? Well, these cofactors are able to uh, to um, deliver electrons in a device, okay, that transport these electrons in a very organized way until oxygen to reduce oxygens. This device is called the electron ch uh, transfer chain, okay, which is formed by four protein complexes, as you probably know. And uh, during this process, protons are extruded to the extra mitochondrial space, and in fact, the intermembrane space, okay? And these protons, which are accumulated there, together with the electrical potential that it is developed between uh, both sides of the membrane, are able to re-entry into the mitochondrial matrix through a very uh, complex machine, which uh, acts like a turbine of, uh, 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 and uh, uses the proton entry force to uh, energize uh, the synthesis of ATP from ADP and phosphate, okay? Of course, this is a very, very simplified scheme. We have other uh, entry doors that are uh, due, for example, to uh, uncoupling proteins, to channels and to uh, metabolites that are co-transported with uh, 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 protons. But at this moment, I will not refer to these uh, uh, processes. I will mention them later, okay? But what would I would like to, to show you is that this closes an electric circuit in the same uh, way or in a similar way than a battery, with the only exception that in, the, in a uh, conventional battery, you have flow of electrons as uh, 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 charge, and, and uh, the difference here is that the flow in the circuit are, is given by protons, okay? So um, once say that, the question that we are trying to answer is, which are the metabolites and how these metabolites fit this battery to produce the reduced cofactors? Hmm? And I will start by proline. So I, in fact, in this talk, I will only mention three of the amino acids. Of course, they are not the only ones, okay? I will start with proline. So to start with proline, we need to know how the proline uh, uh, catabolism happens. So we know that it can happen through two enzymatic steps to go until glutamate and from glutamate to, from glutamate to the uh, components of the TCA cycle, uh, it is very well known and very trivial, and we didn't dedicate to that because it is very well described in the literature. In fact, uh, from glutamate, by deamination, we obtain alpha ketoglutarate, and this is the entry in the, into the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, okay? And this deamination can happen through uh, glutamate dehydrogenases or transaminases. Mm -hmm. uh, so, from glutamate until the Krebs cycle, it is a very well solved uh, problem that has been worked very well by many colleagues. So the thing that we needed to know in this point was how pronin goes until glutamate. So we started by characterizing these two enzymes. Of course, we started by the first one, which is a proline dehydrogenase. We succeed in expressing the proline dehydrogenase in Escherichia coli as a recombinant enzyme, and as well, we succeed in using the gene of Trypanosoma cruzi to make a functional com complementation of uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But from the enzyme expressed in Escherichia coli, we made a very detailed uh, enzymatic enzymological characterization, as you can see here. And one of the things that I would like to attract your attention to is the fact that this is a fat-dependent enzyme. This is not uh, very unique because many proline dehydrogenases are fat-dependent, but this uh, brought us the idea that, in fact, has been put in the literature as a possibility, but never has, uh, never was shown before, that maybe this uh, uh, FADH2 producing enzyme 
could be feeding electrons directly into the respiratory chain. And to make the, <clears throat> the story very short, we were able to prove this because of the characteristic of uh, trypanosomatids enzymes, and this uh, applies also for Leishmania, which, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, uh, trypanosomatid uh, mitochondria, which applies as well for Leishmania, which is the fact that being a so large mitochondria, this is very fragile and you cannot isolate it without breaking it. Okay, and this is usually a problem to study mitochondria, uh, the trypanosomatids, mitochondria, and so on. But we could take advantage of this because when you make this break of the mitochondria during the isolation process in a controlled way, you can have a lot of uh, vesicles, mitochondrial vesicles that resil. Some of them resil inside in, some of them resil inside out, but they resil. In the process, they lost their matrix content, okay? And you can have these vesicles, which are empty, but they have in their membrane, all the components of the respiratory chain. So you can stimulate this mitochondria with um, uh, proline, and you can put proline dehydrogenase in the system and see if there is a transfer of electrons to a component of the respiratory chain. In this case, we choose to measure the reduction of cytochrome C. And as you can see, we could we succeed in showing by the first time, in fact, that proline dehydrogenase could deliver electrons directly to the respiratory chain eh, uh, without needing to go through the Krebs cycle uh, pathway, okay? And we are sure of that because this part, at least part of this uh, reduction of, of uh, cytochrome C was abolished by antimycin A, which is uh, an interrupter of the flux of electrons in the respiratory chain, okay? Uh, this graphic shows uh, uh, just a control of our mitochondrial vesicles preparation. This is a typical marker of uh, matrix enzymes. This is cyproid synthase in which we cannot detect the activity. And this is fumarate reductase, a typical enzyme bound to the uh, inner membrane uh, of the mitochondria, which shows that we have the inner membrane with its enzymes uh, 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 on, on it, but we don't have the matricial enzymes, okay? So <clears throat> from this, we can uh, conclude that uh, the first step of proline oxidation pathway uh, delivers electron into the respiratory chain. Then we went to the second step and we made a very similar approach with a an additional difficulty here that was the fact that <clears throat> when we started to study this uh, enzyme, we uh, were not able to purchase the uh, substrate of the second enzyme of the pathway, which is a pyrroline 5 carboxylate dehydrogenase. Okay. Uh, this, of course, is a problem because you need the substrate to make an enzyme to work. So, uh, what we made was to uh, uh, make a collaboration with a chemist to uh, uh, initiate the in-house synthesis of this compound. It was quite tricky because this compound was not commercially available because it is very unstable. And we tried to make the second enzyme to work with this compound. In this moment, we could not uh, uh, succeed in making the enzyme work with this. Uh, so in, uh, we uh, spent a good time trying to think what could be happening. And to make the story short, what we discovered is that what makes the second enzyme to work is the product of the natural decomposition of this uh, pyrrolic compound. And the natural decomposition was nothing else than the opening of this ring to make this semi-aldehyde, which is an analog of glutamate. So what uh, well, once we discovered that, we made a, a, a complete enzymological characterization and we succeed to make uh, this. So uh, the first thing that I would like to highlight on this is that this means that this uh, pathway is not just to a two enzymat enzymatic steps uh, uh, pathway, but an enzymatic step, a non-enzymatic step, and a new enzymatic step uh, pathway, okay? And this was... Uh, characterized with uh, some detail by us. Here we made a, well, it's a NAT um, uh, dependent uh, enzyme that as well accepts uh, NATP as a cofactor. Uh, and here we used a similar approach of that that we 
uh, that I mentioned for the proline dehydrogenase. In this case, we didn't measure the reduction of cytochrome C, but the, directly the production of ATP. But what we saw was exactly the same. This enzyme as well was able to deliver electrons directly into the respiratory chain, but through these cofactors, okay? So this allowed us to propose uh, a very, at the moment, a very simplified model, which is represented in this chart, but uh, that allow us to make some uh, calculations that I will show you later. Uh, proline can be taken up. This has been characterized previously as well by us. Uh, proline can be taken up uh, through two transporters, a high affinity and a low affinity transporter. Once in the cytoplasm, proline is taken up by the mitochondria. This is a black box. We don't know yet how this happens, okay? But we, we know that it happens. We are trying to characterize this uh, uptake right now. Proline, once inside the mitochondria, is uh, subjected to a first ox oxidation step, which produces FADH2, and P5C, which spontaneously decomposes into the glutamate gamma semialdehyde, which is the substrate of the second enzyme, which produces glutamate with the concomitant, produ concomitant production of NADH. Okay? And all these are delivered into the respiratory chain. So, now I would like to show you the second case, which is histidine. Histidine is a very interesting amino acid. And one thing that is attracting pretty much our attention is the fact that the histidine degradation pathway in trypanosomatids has been found complete only in trypanosoma cruzi. It's not present in Leishmania, trypanosoma brucei, or other trypanosomatids. And we are still trying to understand why. Okay, we don't have an answer for this yet. Mm -hmm. But this is a kind of uh, interesting uh, uh, characteristic and we are trying to understand how it works. So in an early work, we showed that histidine can be transported into the cell and can be oxidized to produce ATP. So the question that we were interested uh, here to approach is how it happens. So the case of histidine is a bit more complex because the pathway, at least in its conventional view, is made, the pathway uh, to glutamate is uh, happens through four enzymatic steps, okay? Not so like the proline situation. So we started to analyze these enzymes one by one. We found the genes encoding the first enzyme and the second enzyme. I will not go to the names just to, to avoid confusion. I will just uh, name them as first, second, third, and fourth, okay, in the order that they appeared in the, in the pathway. Is, I think this is more clear for most of you. So we succeed uh, quite easily in the, uh, in the characterization of the first enzyme, which is here, represented the activity in a kind of Michaelis Mentem uh, curve, and the second enzyme as well. The problem came again when we tried to, ah, sorry, and uh, a detail, the, the fourth enzyme uh, in that time has been uh, uh, analyzed by another group in the USA. So the remaining enzyme to be studied was the third one. And this is, this was, and is being still very tricky because again, we have a problem here with this substrate. This substrate is very unstable and nobody was able to report its biosynthesis, its synthesis uh, uh, so far, okay? So we tried to go again to our chemist uh, collaborators, but they uh, were uh, not able to, to, to make uh, at, uh, so far a biosynthetic, uh, sorry, a chemical synthesis uh, strategy to obtain this in a stable way. So, Thinking the same way that we thought for the proline metabolism, we said, okay, maybe anyway, if it is very unstable, how it goes from this enzyme to this enzyme, how it reaches it without decomposing. Or maybe this these two enzymes are forming a complex and this happens, the transit between the active site of one to the second transit uh, in, in, through an intramolecular channel that can protect it from degradation, but we never succeed in uh, pulling down both enzymes together. So we still remain on the possibility 
of this compound being released by the second enzyme to the third one. And in the way, maybe it decomposes in something that it is this, the true substrate of this one, okay? So this was to applying more or less the same uh, rationale that we applied for the proline metabolism. So the problem was how to measure which is the decomposition production uh, product of this because it has been never uh, uh, obtained and has been never measured. So in this point, we uh, ask it for the help of our collaborators in chemists. And one thing that came from their uh, analysis and calculations was the fact that a possible product of the decomposition of this uh, substrate here was nothing else than alpha ketoglutarate, okay? So this brought a new, a new light on the pathway to us, which was the possibility of having a pathway for full oxidation constituted only for the two first enzyme, and then from the product of the second enzyme, a direct production of alpha ketoglutarate, which could be internalized in the mitochondria and directly be uh, could be directly oxidized through the Krebs cycle, okay? So one of the things that we thought is that if this is true, maybe the pathway was a two-step, two enzymatic step pathways and non-enzymatic step, okay? <clears throat> and from this alpha ketoglutarate, maybe what people saw to define the pathway this way was nothing else than the reverse way from alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate and from glutamate to form aminoglutamate. Okay, so maybe uh, when the pathway was defined by the first time, um, uh, they didn't think that the way could be this one in spite of being this one. Okay, I hope it is uh, clear so far. Okay, so how do we how we could show this possibility. We are making, we are still making several experiments, but I will show, uh, show you the first one, which is uh, a really consolidated result. And this is a conceptually very simple. What we made was to uh, have a strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That in fact, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a yeast that doesn't have this pathway, okay, it naturally lack this pathway, okay? And what we made with this uh, yeast was to transfect it in order to put inside the genes of Trypanosoma cruzi encoding for both enzymes, the first and the second one, okay? Both in the same, in the same cell, okay? And once we had this uh, uh, yeast transfected this way, we, uh, we stimulated this uh, yeast with a uniformly labeled uh, C14 histidine. I mean, this histidine has radio labeled uh, carbon in all these carbons. And we uh, let this, uh, we incubated this yeast and we put a CO2 trap in order to uh, uh, assess the possible release of radio labeled CO2, which in fact happened, okay? The system is very noisy, as you can see, this is the non-transfected yeast, and this is the yeast transfected with empty and empty plasmid, but this is the yeast which has been transfected with both enzymes. And as you can see, we have a good quantity of CO2 release coming from histidine, okay? In in our system, which in principle show the uh, uh, supports the hypothesis of a two degrad a two step degradation pathway for histidine instead of four step degradation pathway. Okay. So this allowed us to propose this uh, chart, this mod, this uh, metabolic pathway represented in this chart, in which the red arrows represents our proposal and the black arrows here represents the uh, proposal that has been uh, um, uh, uh, in the literature for the last uh, 60 years, okay? So we propose that the true pathway in fact is this one, I mean, first step of, of degradation, second, which is uh, deamination, second step. And from here, a non-enzymatic step to alpha ketoglutarate or oxyglutarate, which are synonyms. 
and from here inside the mitochondria and to the Krebs cycle to produce the oxidation with the concomitant production of the cofactors that fits the respiratory chain. Okay. And finally, I will go to alanine. Um, in the case of alanine, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to mention that in terms of its pathway uh, until pyruvate, as I mentioned, is, is very simple because it is only one enzymatic step which can be made by transaminases. I mean, alanine is produced by the transamination of pyruvate during the metabolism, as I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, but this reaction is uh, highly reversible. So alanine in principle could, could uh, go back to pyruvate and pyruvate could be uh, converted in, into acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria and could be fully oxidized in the TCA side, okay? So the question is, the question here is that we know, as I mentioned in the, at the beginning of the talk, we know that alanine is excreted as, a, as an end product of the metabolism. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is curious because it is a very valuable metabolite in terms of bioenergetics. So the question was, is it possible that alanine is accumulated extracellularly? Okay, and in a very, um, uh, emergential situation in terms of the bioenergetics of the parasites, could it be taken up again back into the cell and be and make the reverse pathway to be oxidized and to produce ATP? Is this possible? The answer is yes. So we measured the uptake of alanine through an active transporter that is coupled with the entry of uh, protons. This requires a proton uh, uh, and, and membrane potential uh, having a, a component of proton gradients here. These protons are extruded by an, a, 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 a proton uh, at ATPase, okay? And we could measure the uptake of uh, alanine in this way. So the next question is, is, is alanine, uh, has alanine a bioenergetic fate? And the answer is again, yes. Here, I will, I will not go into the details, but what we could measure is that the uh, uh, star red parasites, this is very similar to the table uh, that has been made in the 70s that I showed at the beginning. What we made was to start the parasites and then to submit them to um, the presence of uh, alanine or histidine as a control uh, or nothing, okay? This is a kind of modified PBS. Mm -hmm. And what we see what we see here is that the presence of alanine triggers the oxygen consumption mm -hmm. and fits uh, in some way, uh, fits the respiratory chain. And we were interested in evaluating if this system uh, was able to recover the ATP levels that were that uh, fault because of the starvation. So here we had the starved parasites with this level of uh, intracellular ATP, and here we stimulated with proline and histidine as controls, and we saw that when we stimulated the parasites with alanine, we had more or less the, the same level of recovery of ATP levels, showing that alanine could be really uh, uh, not only reuptaken from the extracellular medium, but could be used as well for ATP synthesis, uh, for mitochondrial ATP synthesis. This was confirmed in this bar here because when we treated the mitochondria, the parasites with antimicin A, the recovery of ATP was abolished. Okay. So this allowed us to propose that alanine could enter inside. We know that uh, it can be transaminated into pyruvate. This is by, from the literature. It can be transaminated into pyruvate in the cytosol and pyruvate can be uh, uh, uptaken by the mitochondria. This was a paper of this year by the group of Roberto Do Campo. But we don't know and we think that still alanine can enter directly into the mitochondria and be uh, Desaminated by transamination into pyruvate uh, inside the mitochondria. This is something that we are currently investigating now. Okay. The thing, and uh, what well, this is one of the last things of this part, uh, is that the Trypanosoma cruzi has as well an alanine racemase, which means that it 
can convert L-alanine into D-alanine. And this was a very interesting uh, surprise. So we were interested in an analyzing uh, this enzyme. We cloned it and we uh, expressed it in, in bacteria. And to make it uh, very short, we could measure its activity in both directions from D-alanine to L and from L-alanine to D. And uh, this is a very, this, this uh, showed the kinetics, which is very typical from racemasis, okay? And uh, curiously, it is able as well to racemase, uh, to, ras to racemase uh, serine, okay? And this is something that we are currently investigating as well. But whatever, what we were interested uh, in looking at is the fact that, okay, if, Alanine is excreted, uh, and there is a racemase here. Okay, what is probably excreted is a mixture of L and D-alanine. So the question that came here was if D-alanine could be uptaken as well, and the answer is yes, it can be uptaken. Okay, with a different kinetics than the uh, L-alanine, the uptake is less efficient, but it happens through sorry through. Uh, apparently, it happens through the same system because when we competed the uptake of the alanine with L, we have uh, an inhibition, and we, when we make the reciprocal inhibition, we got similar results. Okay, so we propose now that both, in fact, are taken up through the same transporter and with the same mechanism involved. Okay. These are the kinetics, uh, uh, the comparative kinetics, as you can see. Uh, sorry, because the axes are in different scales. We should have them in the same scale. But as you can see, the maximum velocity here will, uh, will go more or less to 0.5 uh, um, um, uh, nanomoles per 20 million cells per minute. And here it is in the order of uh, 1.2 more or less, okay, 1.1.4, sorry, um, sorry 1.2 here, okay. So uh, the thing is that we have that D-alanine is transported and as it can be uptaken again, we made the same measurements to see if alanine, D-alanine could be used also, uh, could trigger also oxygen consumption, which we show here that yes, this is, the modified PBS, and this is histidine as a control. As you can see, the level of oxygen consumption triggered by D-alanine is a bit lower than with D-alanine, with L-alanine, which was similar to histidine, okay? But what it is important is that, is that it is also able to uh, uh, trigger ATP synthesis at the mitochondrial level, which again is abolished by antimicinary, okay? So uh, with this, we have a much more complex uh, situation with the alanine uh, use for bioenergetics in which both L or D can be taken up. They can be interconverted in, inside the cytoplasm and um, uh, they can be transaminated in the, uh, I mean, the L form can be transaminated in the cytosol and be transported as pyruvate or it, we don't know still if it can be transported as L-alanine or maybe the alanine to the mitochondria. This is something, like I said, that we are still investigating, okay? And finally, this is the last part of my talk. I don't know how I am with the time, just a minute to check. Okay, I think that I need to round up the, the talk more or less now, but I would like to go quite quickly to some um, calculations that we can make about mitochondria. Okay, which is, uh, I think it is very interesting because it, I, I think that we need to start to make a most, more quantitative biochemistry to start to, for example, make, make predictions. So we have in the lab a very uh, useful setup for making uh, mitochondria, for making studies on mitochondrial physiology. The core of this is this equipment, which is a high resolution respirometer, a high resolution oxygrapher. Uh, in this case, we have one. Uh, by, made by Ouroboros, which is a, a, a company that it is set in Austria, okay? And this, and this uh, very uh, weird equipment, in fact, it has two chambers here. One is covered here, the other is, is, is free, you can see it. And these chambers uh, holds the 
parasites or the cells that you want to analyze, okay, inside. These are uh, uh, closed chambers. Hmm? And these, these blue things here and here are elect uh, oxygen electrodes. This uh, thing that it is connected here and the other that it is not connected here are uh, um, devices for making um, real-time fluorometry on the same sample that you can measure the oxygen uh, uh, remaining in the chamber. And uh, you, so from here, you can obtain uh, several useful parameters, okay? So what we measure here essentially is uh, um, the fluorescence and the oxygen remaining in the liquid that we, the culture medium, for example, that we put in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And from this, we can get this kind of records, okay? In which the blue, the, the um, sorry, the violet line here, is the remaining oxygen, uh, sorry, I will start with it. The blue uh, line here is the oxygen remaining in the chamber, which is when you put, for example, the cells in the presence of a metabolite starts to uh, diminish a long time, okay? And the, uh, if you consider that this is a time course curve, the inclination, the slope of this uh, uh, curve, in fact, represents a velocity which is the velocity of oxygen consumption. And you can set up the software in a way that it calculates point by point the uh, slope of this uh, curve. And you can have these kind of graphics, which you can then deconvolute to have uh, precise numbers, okay? So for example, if you put in the chambers the cells and the metabolites, you have the cells respirating uh, uh, consuming oxygen to oxidize this metabolite in particular. And in these conditions, you have what you can call the routine respiration. I mean, the cells standing along with, with their metabolites and just staying, just breathing, okay? And then you can start to add, uh, make subsequent additions, for example, of oligomycin in order to block the uh, ATP synthesis, the mitochondrial ATP synthesis, and when you titrate the oligomycin and, and, and get the minimal uh, oxygen consumption that uh, happens in the presence of this metabolite, but without uh, oxygen consumption, you have what is called the leak respiration. This is the respiration associated to the reentry of protons in the, into the mitochondrial matrix through all the other paths that I mentioned before that can happen when you don't have ATP synthesis. Okay, so the difference between the routine respiration and the leak respiration, okay, is the quantity of oxygen consumed uh, associated to ATP synthesis. And the leak respiration is the oxygen consumed not associated to the ATP synthesis. Okay, and then you can uncouple the system with uh, FCCP or uh, any other uh, proton uncoupler, okay? And what you have is the maximum capacity for this respiratory chain, okay? So this is a typical curve. And we can deconvolute these curves in order to obtain uh, values for these parameters like are uh, here. This, for example, has been obtained and I will show mostly all, uh, all this for proline because there is no time for showing for all the metabolites. But here, for example, you have the respiration parameters in uh, MRC, which is the modified PBS, okay? In which you can see that we have some basal, uh, some basal uh, uh, respiration activity, but not very much. And it is not very responsive to the treatment with oligomycin or the uncoupler, okay? But when we put proline, the uh, resting state, the routine respiration uh, is really significantly higher as, as expected. We have a value of leak respiration, which is not far away from the leak respiration in the absence of any metabolite, okay? And this distance from this to this is what is really associated to ATP synthesis, okay? And with this, we can make a kind of, some kind of easy calculations, for example, Making a very, very basic and simplistic model, we can say that for oxidizing one oxygen molecules, we need the uh, uh, flux of four electrons through the respiratory chain. 
Okay, so from the quantity of oxygen uh, uh, flowing, for example, uh, for the respiratory chain associated to ATP synthesis, okay, we can derive it the quantity of electrons that has been committed to this process. And if you, and, and knowing this is from uh, electricity, knowing that one ampere uh, corresponds to the flux of 6.25 10, uh, times 10 to 8 electrons per second, we can calculate how many amperes we have uh, uh, in the system. So for example, here we calculated for several metabolites. Here, for example, we have proline. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have that uh, one mitochondria fed with proline uh, uh, has um, uh, uh, can develop a current of almost 400 femtoamperes. Okay, and we can also measure the membrane potential, which uh, uh, we made following a method that has been described by Peter Mitchell's in the uh, 60s, more than 50 years ago, uh, ago, in which he proposed the use of safranin, which is a voltage dependent uh, uh, probe. And making, uh, following his protocol, okay, and uh, using a calibration curve, we arrived to a value of approximately 220 millivolts, negative inside, of course. Uh, this is the uh, membrane potential in, in millivolts of the trypanosoma cruzi mitochondrial inner membrane, okay? And uh, uh, this was calculated for um, offering uh, the, to the parasite proline at the concentration of three millimolars. Okay, so putting all this value together, we can, uh, for example, calculate the power of this mitochondria in watts, okay? So we are, uh, we know now that, uh, for example, a single mitochondria of trypanosoma cruzi fed with uh, three millimolar proline can develop a power of approximately 80, milli, 80 femtowatts, okay? So for people not uh, having a clear idea of how much, how much is it, um, uh, let's say that if we could make the proper arrangement of mitochondria connected in, in, in serial and parallel to give the, the proper voltage and, and current, we would need uh, in the order of 30,000 parasites to keep a red LED, a high efficiency red LED uh, light, okay? Um, so, as a conclusion, this uh, battery, in the case of Trypanosoma cruzi, develops power of between 60 and 130 femtowatts per cell, depending on the metabolite and the conditions in which we measure this. And this is enough for synthesizing the ATP needed for the server functions of Trypanosoma cruzi epimastigotes. Okay. Well, we are expanding all these studies to uh, all the amino acids. So we are analyzing all these metabolic pathways and now some, some, some others that are not uh, schematized in this uh, slide. But uh, this is uh, the core of our uh, project on biochemistry and bioenergetics. And with this, I would like to finish my talk, uh, just uh, um, saying thank you very much for the people that was more uh, committed and participated most uh, more of this uh, uh, project and these results. I would like to highlight uh, the members of my group, which are uh, described here, and uh, Lisbane, uh, who uh, was the one that started this uh, line of research as a PhD student many years ago, and Brian, who was fundamental as well uh, uh, in these uh, studies, and who is currently uh, a fellow of the uh, our GCRF, GCRF project uh, based in Durham University. So thank you very much. And uh, now I am available for taking your questions. Sorry, this is the uh, slide, the typical uh, pandemic slides of our group uh, 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 so far. So thank you very much. And I am ready for taking your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Ariel, uh, for your expensive and very, very, um, you know, enlightening uh, presentation and talk. Um, with this, uh, we just, because we are running out of time, so I would only ask you two short questions. 
um, which have been posted for you in the chat box. Number one is the question uh, from Mr. Jim. He's asking, are any of the amino acid metabolic enzymes encoded by a mitochondrial DNA? Uh, I cannot hear you. Sorry, uh, sorry, I, I, I was muted. Uh, no, uh, all the all the enzymes uh, so that we identified so far, all them are encoded in the nuclear genome. Okay, they, in fact, uh, most of uh, the mitochondrial genome encodes some components of respiratory chain, tRNAs, and it's a conventional uh, mitochondrial genome in this in this point. Right. So here is another question from Ms. Noor. She's asking, uh, first of all, she's thanking you for a very nice presentation. And she's asking, is there any connection between amino acids being used by T. Cruzi and the host environment? Well, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we uh, this uh, I, I didn't mention, but uh, we um, uh, we I studied. Uh, relatively with, with some detail, for example, the consumption of proline by the parasites when they are as in, the, in, the, in the intracellular situation, when they are infecting the mammalian host cells. We know that, for example, proline is essential in this situation, but this proline is the proline uh, provided by the host cell metabolism. So the parasite is able to take up this proline from the mammalian uh, host cell cytoplasm and uh, accumulate it inside and eventually oxidize it. So yes, uh, this is very difficult to map because um, um, it is very difficult to, to split uh, in a precise way the metabolism of the intracellular parasite from the, metabolism, from the metabolism of the cells, but we are uh, working on it. And uh, the, the answer is yes, yes, they are very well related. Okay, um, so here is the last question. Uh, okay, let me see. So, Ms. Okay, there are so many, there are many comments praising your uh, presentation, I must say, and there are people who are wishing that you were teaching their students. <laughs> And okay. uh, so uh, here is a question. Yeah, there is one suggestion. Uh, I think you can comment on that. Can we talk about amino acid transport transporters later? So I guess there is a title for your next talk. <laughs> <with us. laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I, I can see it's, uh, I think it is Santusa, yeah, my, my yeah. friend and colleague Santusa. Uh, so of course, Santusa, I will be delighted. <laughs> yeah, so here is the last question because we're running out of time. Can mitochondrial yeah. proteins of T. Cruzi or other parasites be good targets for the biomarkers or drugs? Um, can we talk about, sorry, I, can you repeat the question? I, I, I yes, didn't get it. Uh, he, this is from Mr. Hassan. He's uh, saying, great talk. Can mitochondrial proteins of P. cruzi or other parasites mm. be good targets for biomarkers or drugs? Well, for drugs, we are betting a lot on that. I mean, and, and we are, uh, in fact, uh, collaborating with uh, uh, some people at the GCRF network. In, in fact, I saw that uh, Tony Wilkinson, for example, is here, and uh, we are uh, trying to get the structure of this, uh, of some of these proteins in order to design drugs. Uh, uh, we have some uh, preliminary data showing that this, uh, some of these enzymes are really essential and they would be a good drug targets. And um, as a biomarker, I am not sure. Uh, we are not uh, that much going in that direction, but it could be, it could be tried. And uh, if somebody is interested in, in working with these proteins in that direction, we can, we can help and collaborate, of course. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Adrian, for your time and talk today. Uh, with this, we come to the end of conclusion, and I still can see many remarks and questions in the chat box, but unfortunately, due to time, uh, we cannot take them. Um, we are also very grateful to our participants who joined us. And again, thank you very much, and we hope to see you and others as well in some other event of ComStack and Entity together. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Hazima, I just. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, add that, uh, Professor Silver, there is lots of comments on your uh, 
uh, on your lecture and we will share this chat with you. Yes, yeah. this is, is something that I wanted to ask you. If you can send them to me and I will, I will try, uh, I will try, please, uh, uh, the people can also send the emails because uh, I don't have the emails of some of the people, okay? And I will try to answer everyone, okay? Okay, uh, thank you, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.